Welcome to Executives at the Edge, a podcast brought to you by MEF. I'm your host, Pascal Benazis. Join me as we explore thought-provoking perspectives from the leaders and change makers who are propelling enterprise digital transformation forward. Well, today I'm really excited to have Vic Fatak. He's the CEO from Cyber Ratings. And today's going to be an incredible episode because we're going to talk about cybersecurity on this one. And no better than Vic, who's an expert in cybersecurity. So Vic, for our listeners, can you tell us a little bit about your background and about, you know, your expertise? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, so uh, I actually, uh, where do I even begin? So the last... Uh, more than a decade, I'd been uh, running things over at NSS Labs, um, actually up until 2018 from 2007. And before that, I had an intrusion prevention product company. Um, and even before that, back in the 90s, I uh, started an ISP in Philadelphia, actually, in the like early mid-90s. So uh, kind of been seeing the gamut of, of things, both from a consumer as well as then a technology provider, as well as then you know, doing the testing and sort of understanding what it is that uh, companies are trying to do. Well, you certainly have an incredible background in cybersecurity and in testing. Now, you work for, you actually, I think, co-founded or founded Cyber Ratings. Yes. And and what it, so tell us, tell our listeners, what does Cyber Ratings do and what's the value you bring out? So, uh, Cyber Ratings, first of all, is a nonprofit. And the mission of is to uh, basically solve the problem that um, products are kind of opaque in terms of how do they work, do they not work, what's really going on. And our mission is to, you know, really solve the problem of where buyers don't really know what they're buying. Well, with a cyber rating stamp, the whole idea is that, well, now you know. Um, you know exactly what you're going to get. And uh, hopefully that starts raising the bar in general. Uh, there's a whole conversation we've been having around the market for lemons and how um, in cybersecurity that buyers don't really know as much as the sellers. So it's kind of like the used car market. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, having somebody that can actually attest to, yeah, we tested it out kind of like the 20 point test you get at a Lexus dealer or something um, or CarMax or something in terms of has the car been in an accident, that sort of cybersecurity equivalent of how good is it? Um, really helps buyers to make better decisions, which then helps money flow from, you know, big marketing claims and big marketing dollars back into the engineering, which is, you know, honestly where the vendors would rather have it anyway, because uh, most of those guys are just engineers and geeks to begin with. And uh, uh, ideally raises the bar in general for everybody in the market. So that's kind of a long answer to a short question, but... No, it's it's great. It totally makes sense. But... I think you do something more unique. You create a rating system. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can explain more because I, I I found that very intriguing when I saw your rating system is exactly, I think, what the industry needs. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, it's, again, having been doing it for a while, we the idea with ratings is looking at what, what's worked in other industries and um, uh, things like places like, like Moody's have got a, like a credit rating where you go AAA, AA, single A, and there's very specific criteria to meet to meet each level of, of a rating, well, there's no reason we can't do the same thing with cybersecurity. It's empirical, it's ones and zeros, and um, again, it gives the buyer a sense of what does this product do or not do. Um, and so that's the whole idea with the rating system. Ah, uh, interesting. Now, you say cybersecurity, you actually test a lot of these cybersecurity products like r and mm -hmm. uh, IDS, IPS, CASBs, and uh, Surtrust, ZTNAs. And could you tell us a little bit about, like, that landscape and what you find. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there's a huge shift right now going on. Um, it used to be that everybody would get themselves a firewall. I mean, of a company of a certain size, right? We'd get a firewall. They would deploy it. They'd deploy some antivirus and, you know, then have some, uh, maybe some, some logging tools or something to sort of tie it all together. Well, the world has changed, right? And it accelerated with the pandemic so that now you know, the, the move to cloud and the move to sort of outsource everything um, simply because there's a, if nothing else, there's a skill shortage in cybersecurity. Even if you wanted to do it the old fashioned way, 
finding the people that you could hire uh, to even do the job for any amount of money is really hard. So being able to go to a Zscaler or a Palo Alto Networks or a Cato Networks or somebody for Sassy, for example, um, and there's lots of other vendors, I don't mean to just mention them, uh, that now you're just dealing with policy. You're not having to worry about the firmware upgrade updates and the signature updates, and did you deploy the architecture properly? All that stuff is taken care of for you. So, but with that now, loss of control means that there needs to be somebody keeping an eye on things to make sure that you're getting what you're buying, right? Otherwise, how do you know that it's really doing something, right? Because it's easy to tell if you're slowed down, but you can't tell if they turn off some defenses so that evasions get past the defense, you know, your security products or cloud now, or if the malware is getting through until you're hit. And then what ends up happening invariably is, you know, the vendor will say, oh, it's an APT. It's some sort of advanced threat. Well, I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I heard that, I would be retired. So um, the the idea with, with what's happening in the market right now is there's, number one, is a huge innovative sh shift to the cloud, which is everybody knows it, and it's it's fantastic. But with that means that, you know, there's a, a whole other level of um, due diligence that's kind of required that um, is beyond the reach of a lot of folks to do themselves. I mean, unless you're a big bank, um, you know, pretty much nobody else can, can do that. So uh, what we're hoping to do is provide some of that visibility in that market. Um, and that's, you know, that's the CASB stuff, that's SASE, that's um, what Gardner's calling SSE, which is the SASE without SD-WAN. Uh, but it's also SD-WAN, how do you know that the steering is working? How do you know that if you run into certain impairments, how do you know if, um, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, a jitter or there's interruption because a wire gets cut in Montreal that um, things are going to get routed properly? Well, that's that's the kind of thing that you need to have somebody like us do. So, And you do all that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, Chelsea, you know, we were talking about this, uh, you discover this, you call it TC. Piece, split handshake. Mm -hmm. Talk about that because I think it's very intriguing to show the skill and the expertise of cyber ratings and how you really understand that landscape. Well, so I, I was actually surprised. If I so we get a, an up an alert from different vendors about different things they're tracking, and one of the ones that sort of caught my eye was that uh, Fortinet came out with one saying that like, I think it was the number three or number four most prevalent attack right now is a TCP split handshake, and about twenty percent of attacks are are using it, and it's a it's an evasion technique that can be used to bypass security devices. It's a fascinating attack because um, it lets you take advantage of um, something that's already built into the protocol, and it's not technically a bug, but it's definitely not the way that people are expecting the technology to work. And so if your security product doesn't properly handle it, um, and understand the difference between is this really a true simultaneous open or is this an attack, then um, it could render your firewall completely use useless or your intrusion, intrusion prevention completely useless. So um, uh, we've been testing it for, oh gosh, more than a decade. And um, uh, it's just fascinating to see that that's one that's actually, you know, 20% of all the attacks on the internet right now are using it. Um, and it's actually something that, you know, we can sort of, I don't want to take full credit, but we kind of came up with um, a number of years ago. So oh, good. Wow, that's wow. yeah. fascinating that you you discover that and actually did use another exploit. So yeah, yeah, it's it's. I these, mean, they, these threat actors are incredible. I mean, I think they're saying now they think cybercrime is going to be I mean, the third richest economy, right? I mean, they're saying behind the United States and China, it's crazy. And they're I think you can go to ransomware as a service. So you can literally go to the dark web, buy rents, and know nothing about it. Go rents and buy your, your, your ransomware as a service and then launch it and I know nothing. I mean, it's just insane. Then they can do it anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And well, so um, cybercrime bypassed drug trafficking from a financial perspective several years ago is more lucrative, which if you think about it is nuts for the criminal gangs. Yeah. They can make more money on cybercrime than they can selling cocaine and heroin and fentanyl and all the rest of it, right? I mean, so this is getting even worse and worse. And now you have operational technologies that run the pipelines and the shippings and 
electricity grids and if they get into that, that's a total mess, right? Well, they're, I mean, so it depends on who they is, but they, they in general, they're already in there. Oh, right? you think that's so, never, right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're already there. I mean, <laughs> it, uh, generally speaking, the state actors have a lot more um, discipline, but there's a technology transfer that ends up occurring that folks who are, you know, let's we'll say state actors over time, that capability ends up rolling into the private sector. In places like Russia in particular, there's a pretty blurry line about what's a state actor versus what's the cyber criminal, right? I mean, and I, you know, look, if, if even if you're um, what's called a legitimate cyber criminal, if there's such a thing, if Putin taps on your shoulder and says that he wants something, you're pretty much going to do it, right? I mean, you, you like having your kids around or not disappearing into some gulag. So <laughs> um, that's, that's uh, you know, one of the challenges is that you have certain state actors um, that are providing a certain amount of uh, legitimacy and, and safe harbor for criminals. They claim they don't, but they really do, right? And... I mean, that's why there's a whole ecosystem, as you mentioned, sort of ransomware as a service. Um, there are folks that specialize only in certain malware payloads, and there's folks who uh, specialize in web hosting, and there's other folks that specialize in tricking somebody to go to the website to begin with. To, I mean, it's just it's pretty incredible, like the level of specialization and the entire supply chain. But the other thing it does is it it means that from a human psychological perspective, it absolves, in, at least in people's minds, it absolves people of responsibility because they're not the ones doing the tech. All they're doing is tell somebody to go to this website. They don't really know what's going to happen when that when they go there, right? It's, yeah, I get it. Right? And so, um, and there's other folks who say, well, you know, okay, I'm making the malware, but, you know, I'm not delivering it. I'm not the one who's putting it, you know, into the children's hospital and messing with the NICU, right? That's not me. So, if you see like there's yeah they, they basically wash their hands from it yeah and it's it's one of the things that organized crimes have been doing for a lot of years right you you separate things out and there's also a i actually wrote something about this a while back that um was concerning and it's ended up happening which is that uh if you look at what happens in organized crime they first get you to do a low level runner thing and it doesn't even matter if there's something illegal or not just getting you to perform the act of taking something from a to b and now you're complicit Right, and that's how they sort of rope you into the next level, the next level, the next level, and that's what's been happening to you know in the cybercrime arena. There's a lot of folks that um, you know if you're in some of these countries, it may be well. Do you start off as sort of a cybercrime runner or a mule or something, or do you starve? I mean, there's not a whole lot of opportunity right outside of this arena, so. And, you know, I mean, we've seen over the years, people can rationalize a whole lot to themselves when required. And truthfully, it's pretty hard to tell somebody it's better that you starve than some credit card company loses, you know, 50 bucks off of, or 500 bucks off of, um, you know, some sort of credit card theft. And that's how they justify it. So changing topic. So we've got this idea of sassy now. So hopefully mm -hmm. to protect from these threat actors and mm -hmm. the state sponsor the uh, actors. This idea of secure access service edge means mm -hmm. that security goes into the cloud nearest the edge from where any user or device is. What's your thoughts on SASE and, you know, MEF's about to just, for our listeners, MEF is about to standardize SASE any day now, stay tuned, mm -hmm. and Zero Trust. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on SASE, and then we want to certify it. Now, I'd love to hear your thoughts on certification, which is very hard to do because you can't certify once it's done. It's... Right. Because every day there's something new. So can you help our listeners with this? Well, it's it, it, to your point, it's, it's something that has to be ongoing because whether or not um, you change or your product changes, the threat actors are adapting and they're changing, right? So even if you don't do anything at all, by just by default, the, your protection is degrading over time as the threat actors are adapting and, you know, learning what you're doing so they can get past it. So it's this constant cat and mouse game. And, you know, one of the things, if you're looking to buy a SASE, one of the things I'd encourage is don't just look at a point in time because um, you're buying into a service that you presumably are going to have multiple years. So understanding what the commitment of the partner or the service provider that you're, you're, um, you're, you're working with 
what's their commitment to making sure that not just today, but in the future, that they're providing you with the protection you need is really, really important. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, nobody has a crystal ball to say, you know, here's what the future is going to be in three years. But um, looking at how companies perform when they first uh, find ad under adverse conditions is kind of the key. If you find a product that's 100%, there's no such thing. Okay, let's just start there. So the question is, when somebody starts missing something, how do they respond? How quickly do they take responsibility and fix the problem is a really good indicator for how well you can, how much you can trust them to do the same for you when the time comes, if you sign up for that service. So um, over, that's one of the things we're working on is, obviously we're not gonna have that level of snapshot like out of the gate, but we expect that within a few months, we can get a pretty good idea um, with some metrics like time to detect, um, which basically says how long does it take from when they miss something to when they start blocking it. They give you a, a good idea of sort of the, the commitment and the um, sort of cultural and managerial approach to cybersecurity for the, the service provider. So we hope that when we do some certifications, um, that that's the kind of thing that that will start coming out over time and people can make good decisions based upon that. But don't you think enterprises want to know some kind of gauge of, if I'm going to use this secure cloud, this mm -hmm. sassy cloud, that's supposed to secure me from the clouds, the internet, and all the threat actors you can, that Mallory talked about. Wouldn't you think they want to know some kind of score, like you talked about oh, the yeah. cyber rating, oh, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. you think? Certification should have some kind of score. Oh, it shouldn't be constantly like evaluating how well that posture is continuing to protect them. Absolutely, yes. So I, I didn't mean to give the impression of that that I probably jumped over things because I, I'm, I'm, you know, up to my eyeballs and then doing it all the time, so I forget <laughs> to sometimes. So absolutely, I mean, having having just an empirical score to begin with is, I mean, I don't know how else you would judge whether or not something is good or not. Like it's, I, I just don't know how you would do it. So um, absolutely, that's that's the first place you start. All I was getting at was that, you know, watching over time and seeing the trajectory, right? If you see somebody starts off really good and then over time they start, they're sliding down, that's probably not who you want to pick. You'd rather pick somebody who maybe started a little lower and they're working their way up, right? That's, but I guess I'm getting ahead of myself because the beginning is, you just want to know how, how do they do to begin with, right? Well, Vic, it's been a pleasure having you on this episode. I think um, with the world and everybody's so interested in SASE, you know, that cloud-based security, and what MEF is about to release their standard in SAS and Zero Trust, and soon we'll have a certification. And I think the certification really has to be rethought. And um, it's really been a pleasure having you on this episode, Vic. You're an outstanding, very brilliant guy in the space, so we're very excited. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. And thanks for having me.